Building a web app can be frustrating and overwhelming these days. There are countless front-end frameworks, different architectures, and multiple rendering strategies you have to choose from. Since the web is neither as complex as game dev, nor as sensitive as the embedded systems, web developers have to create their own job security through useless complexity. What you might not realize though, since you are being inundated by all these different options, is that there are just a couple of concepts you need to understand and apply in order to easily build a state-of-the-art, performant application. So let's see these concepts in practice while building a basic web app. Things are actually really simple. All you need is a web server listening for incoming HTTP requests, perform your business logic, maybe store some data in a storage solution, render an HTML response, and send it back to the browser. The browser will then parse and display that HTML. The HTML standard allows users to interact with the web page via links and forms. Whenever a link is clicked or a form is submitted, another HTTP request is sent to the server, and we go through the same process again. When the HTML response comes back, the browser will parse it and replace the existing page with the new one. We call this a multi-page application architecture. The alternative is the single-page application architecture, where the HTML is usually rendered on the client using JavaScript files and JSON data sent from the server. This approach has some benefits, but comes with a lot more complexity. On top of that, the focus shifted fully towards multi-page applications and server-side rendering in recent years, mainly because of performance reasons. So in this video we'll focus on building multi-page applications, but if you are interested in a proper deep dive into SPAs as well, please let me know in the comments. I mentioned that users can interact with HTML on the browser via links and forms, but these elements will cause a full-page refresh. This is not the user experience your potential clients are expecting. Modern web apps can perform server actions in an async manner and, when the response is received, update only parts of the page instead of doing a full page refresh. Of course, this is done via JavaScript library. While React, Angular and Vue are the most popular options, all these frameworks are better suited for building single-page applications. In our case, since we are building a multi-page app, options like Alpine, Petit View or HTMX are better suited. There are a couple of ideas you have to keep in mind when deciding on a stack. First of all, performance is a key aspect when building for the web. This is true for both the server and the client. Your backend services need to return fast responses while being easily deployable and scalable. The client, on the other hand, has to quickly display meaningful content to the user while relying on an efficient network communication. Your users might run on bad internet or mobile data, so you have to avoid sending unnecessary bits over the wire. Second, the popularity and adoption of your tools is really important. Whenever you are committing to a stack, you have to think long term. So always try to pick frameworks and libraries which have a good chance of still being around in 10 years. Wide adoption usually implies good community support, frequent releases, and a rich collection of third-party libraries. So, in this video, we'll use GoTogether with Gene on the server and HTMX on the client. The reasons behind my decision are straightforward. Go is one of the fastest growing languages on GitHub and is the perfect mix between simplicity and performance. On top of that, Go programs are built into a single binary executable file, which is a godsend in the deployment process. Go also comes with a very powerful standard library, which covers the basics of a web server. However, I will add Gin into the mix for convenience reasons, even though the Go purists will roll their eyes. Start by installing Go locally if you haven't already. Then, we'll initialize a new project and add our gene dependency. If you are not familiar with Go, don't worry. Go is famous for its simplicity, and the next couple of minutes will be a crash course on the subject. We'll start by defining a main package and function in a new main.go file. These two lines are mandatory in any application, since this is the entry point into our execution. Then, we'll declare and initialize a name variable using the shorthand syntax. Most of the time, the Go compiler infers the type based on the value assigned to it, but you can also use the standard syntax if you want to be more explicit. Finally, we'll import the format package and print our formatted string to the console. Back in the terminal, we can execute the go run command, and we just finished the go hello world example. Note that the entire process is really streamlined, and the Go compiler is famous for its speed. Now, let's move to something a bit more interesting and add a web server into the mix. Once Gin is imported, we can create an engine instance and register a get listener to the root path. When a request comes in from the client, the code inside this method is executed and some sort of response is sent back to the client. The handler is an anonymous function which receives the context of the current HTTP request as an argument. This is actually a pointer used for performance reasons. 
The context could be a large structure, and passing it by value would require the entire entity to be copied on the stack. This can be expensive in terms of both time and memory. By passing a pointer, only the address of the struct is copied, which is a small, constant-sized piece of data. Then, we'll simply set the response content type to JSON and provide some data in the body. Finally, we can start our HTTP server and listen to incoming requests at the 8080 port with the run method. You can now jump in the browser and see the result. However, we mentioned at the beginning of the video that in a multi-page application architecture, the browser should receive HTML instead of JSON. So let's go ahead and do that. Under the templates directory, I'll add a new index.html file, which contains a simple header for now. Back in the main.go file, we'll first register the templates directory into the gene engine, and then update the get handler to return HTML. Note that we can easily pass properties from the Go context into the HTML template. Of course, in real-world scenarios, users perform a myriad of operations, so most often than not, you'll need to handle post, put and delete requests as well. In order to do this, we have to make a quick detour into data storage solutions. When it comes to databases, the options are really diverse. However, we'll keep things simple here as well, so let's go ahead and add SQLite in our Go project. Then, we'll create a new service.go file, which will contain all our database logic and interactions. In Go, we can use structures to represent a to-do item in our system. The fields are capitalized to mark them as exported and accessible from outside the package, and we use the JSON tag to provide metadata, which can be used to convert the entity into JSON when sending data over the network. We'll then define an init database function, which will open our database. For SQLite, this is just a file on the disk. Next, we'll create a to-do table if it doesn't exist already. Then, we can add the create and delete methods, and there are a couple of things to note here. First, Go lets you return multiple values from the same function. Second, Go errors are treated as values. While this makes your error handling a tad more verbose than in other languages, it forces you to actively think about exceptions and build more reliable products. Finally, the compiler will complain every time declared variables are not used, so you can use the blank identifier to ignore such values. The read to do list method is a bit more involved, since we need to convert the query response to our structure. We'll use the make keyword to initialize a slice and use a pen to add new to-dos in the existing collection. Back in the main.go file, we'll first initialize the database and then defer the closing of the database connection. Closing connections is really important and the defer key makes sure this will happen once the main function finishes execution. Then, we'll update the get handler to render and return an HTML page containing all the to-do entities and we'll define handlers for the post and delete requests, which we'll simply call the database methods we defined a bit earlier. All these templates are defined in the templates directory, and we'll jump into index.html to finally add some client interactivity. I mentioned that standard HTML can interact with the server in a synchronous manner via links and forms. So I could define a simple form that will trigger post requests to our to-do endpoint whenever the save button is clicked. This will perform a full page refresh, and we can do better than this. Enter HTMX. The appeal of HTMX is that it is a small library that allows you to sprinkle in JavaScript interactivity directly through HTML markup. Consider the following bit of HTML. What this markup tells the browser is that when a user clicks on a button, an HTTP POST request should be issued, and the content from the response should replace the element with the parent ID. In our specific example, we can easily convert a synchronous form POST request into an asynchronous AJAX-based request. First, we need to add the HTMX script in our page header. Then, we can replace the action and method attributes with a POST special attribute. The AJAX call will now be dispatched, and we are expecting an HTML snippet displaying the newly added task as the response. When the response is received, we'll append it to the tasks list. Using the same approach, we'll add in a delete button, which will trigger a delete HTTP request when clicked. By the way, if you like this tech stack, but you don't want to reinvent the wheel, PocketBase could be a great starter for your next project. This is an open-source backend solution which comes with a lot of features out of the box. Let me know in the comments if you are interested in a proper deep dive into PocketBase, and check some of my other crash courses if you found this video useful. Until next time, thank you for watching.